Well, good morning again, church. Good morning. Turn with me to Job 38. We're going to try to cover a lot today and finish out the book of Job. And for some of you, that'll be exciting. For some of you, you may not be ready to finish Job, but we're going to try to get through 38 through 42. Obviously, we're not going to hit every individual scripture, so I encourage you to go back and, and look at some of this and check over it and reread and, and all those things as you should, as I say, for any of the, the messages we have. But we'll pick up here at 38, and this is sort of what we've been waiting for. In the story of Job, right? We've gone through Job and we've seen what's been going on with him and, and we know the conversations between God and Satan at the beginning and then uh, Job's friends come in and how that's all gone. And in all of this, uh, God hasn't said anything yet. God hasn't spoken to Job directly. And, and that's really what Job has been wanting, right? Job's big request in all of this has just been for God to, to answer him, right? Job uses the idea of a, of a trial. Job talks about just wanting to hear sort of the answer any of us would want to hear, right? Why? Why did this happen? What? Why? Why was, why was this allowed or why did this go on or, or any of it? And I think if we're honest, a lot of us feel like Job more often than we'd like to admit. Not that we deal with the same issues Job has dealt with, but we just want the answer, right? We just want to know why. And if we could just get the why, then it makes everything else easier, right? Right? If I understand why it happens, then I can stomach it a little easier. But if I don't understand the why, then I can't get there. And so when we look at what's going on here in 38, finally, the Lord is going to answer. And I love how 38, my scripture, at least it has the, some things about the different chapters above it. In mine, it just says, the Lord speaks. And if you mark or write your Bible or if you happen to highlight scriptures, and that's a good place to start. Anywhere in scripture that says the Lord speaks, you're going to want to jot that down. Sort of maybe commit that to memory, right? We, we want to know that. And so we see here at 38, the Lord speaks. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. And he said, who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man when I question you. You will inform me. Now you just pause right there for a minute. You talk about an opening line that would shake you to your inmost being. Right? For Job to sit here and for God to speak to him and say, hey, when you answer me, you better answer me like a man. Right? For those of you military, those of you that serve in the military, this is the equivalent of what? Sound off like you know what you're talking about, right? I won't finish that statement. But that's what's basically being said here. When you answer me, you better answer clearly. You better, you better be ready. Don't come at me. This is what God is saying. Don't come back to me with some hums and, well, uh, maybe, I thought. No, you be ready. Right? Don't, don't do... The typical human thing, right? When we get confronted, sometimes we sort of, huh, uh. he's not here this morning, but Brian King, we had the, uh, I don't know if it was fortunate for us or unfortunate for the person he went after, but we had the ability to go to one of the graduation services he was a part of at Lackland, and we were with Dottie, his wife, and we were going to find seats. It had been rainy that morning, and, and we were trying to sit off to a side where there wasn't anybody sitting yet. And I don't know what this poor guy was thinking when he told Dottie she couldn't go over there, but he happened to say it loud enough where Brian could hear. And for those of you who don't know, Brian is an instructor at Lackland. And this poor man sort of kind of got a little loud with his wife. And Brian caught wind of it. And I've never seen Brian go into attack mode as far as his job went, but I, that's about as close as I've seen it. And he came into this dude, and this guy didn't know what to do. And just instantly, uh, 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 and Brian just stopped him in his tracks. And so for me, when I read this, that's sort of my understanding is that's what God is saying right here. God is telling Job, when you answer me, you better bring it. And I think for any of us, when we look at, when we speak to God, that's sort of the idea that when we speak to God, we should be ready. Not that he doesn't understand or hear when we're not. But in this situation, or in most of our situations, we should be ready. So then God gets into the rest. He says in 4, where were you when I established the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations? Or who laid its cornerstone? And we pause there again and look at 6. Uh, what supports its foundation? Uh, can anyone in this building tell me with certainty what the center of the earth is made out of? Well, we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, as far as we know, it could be cheese, right? We don't. We have no idea. We have assumptions of what we think it is, but we've never gotten there. 
We've never gotten to the center of the earth to know what the inmost of it is. And this is in 2020, right? The most technological time ever in the history of humanity. We don't know what the center of our planet is. We, we really don't know more than about 20 miles, give or take. And that's just guessing as best we can. And so he asked that question, who, what supports its foundation or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst from the womb? When I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its blanket. When I determined its boundaries and put its bars and doors in place. When I declared you may come this far, but no farther. Your proud waves stop here. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or assigned the dawn its place? So it may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wickedness or the wicked out of it. You think about what God is saying. What is God saying to Job right there? You think you understand something, Job. If you understand anything, you tell me about this. Tell me about this if you think you understand something. And we've talked about God's power. We've, you know, that's where I take the idea where we say, if you think you have power, go tell the waves to stop and see how it works out for you. But we see that in 13, so it may seize, that the morning may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wicked out of it. We think about how God formed the planets and everything around us. And the miraculous way that that happened, that earth sits in such a perfect position that life is not only sustained here, but thrives. We think about the different things about our universe, how it is put together. There is no way, I, I don't think... Even as someone who likes science, I enjoy science, you can't figure that happen without some sort of intelligent design. I believe the science, if you really get into the science of, our, of creation, it all points back to a creator. And so when we see what God is saying here, that's exactly kind of what he's telling Job. If you think you know anything, you tell me how this works. Tell me how this happens. And I think for us in our humanity, it, it means something to us today in 2020, because as I've said, uh, we are in one of the most technologically advanced societies ever. America, I mean, you think about it. I talk about us being the I want it now generation, and it's true. I mean, in Lytle, you can order something on Amazon today and have it win. Tomorrow, right? If you live in San Antonio, you could order and have it in an hour. And so you think about how different our society, how much technology, how much information we have. I was reading an article this week, and it said for the first, one of the first times in existence, historians will have a problem of too much information. Trying to process what is and what isn't worth holding on to. Yet there are still things we don't understand. Still things that we can't hope to grasp. Because we just don't have the power that God has. So we look then, we're going to jump here to 31 through 36 in chapter 38. It says this, Can you fasten the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? Can you bring out the constellations in their seasons? Leave the bear and her cubs. Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you impose its authority on earth? Can you command the clouds so that a flood of water covers you? Now think about that for a minute, church. If we have the power to create rain, how fertile would our ground be? But you think about where we live here, right? We still pray for rain. I don't know about y'all. I still pray for rain because my ground is dry. We don't have that power. 35, can you send out lightning bolts and they go? Do they report to you, here we are? You think about that kind of, just commanding lightning, right? Because we could create, I mean, I can rub my feet back and forth, make static, come touch you on the ear and make you yell, right? But commanding a lightning bolt, right? For those of you Back to the Future fans, right? That's the end of the first movie. They attract a lightning, they know where a piece of lightning is going to strike, they attract it, send it into the DeLorean and send Marty back to the future. So that's as close as we could get. We can't control a thunderstorm's lightning and tell it where to go, right? That's why we have to have lightning rods on tall things. But then we get to 36. Who 
put wisdom in the heart or gave the mind understanding. And so God goes from these broad terms of creating the earth and, and its foundations, going into the stars and the heavens around us, but then he brings it all the way back here. Who put wisdom in the heart? Or gave the mind understanding. And we think about that. And it takes me to creation. It takes me to humanity. We think about how we as individuals, we as humans, are put together from the beginning. I think about something as complex as the human eye. And how when we look at a baby in the womb, there are nerve endings that begin in the eye and there are nerve endings that begin in the brain and they grow towards each other in utero, eventually connecting with its perfect pair and creating vision. That can't be random. I just don't see it. The probability tells us, if we really look at the math, the probability tells us it is less likely for it to be random than it is to be creation. And so what's God doing here? What's God really saying to Job? Well, he's telling Job, he's giving Job the understanding of exactly who he is. This is God sort of introducing himself to Job and telling him, this is who I am. This is what I've done. So before you say anything else, keep that in mind. It makes me think about situations where someone begins speaking to someone without knowing who they are. One of the scientists I like to watch some of his shows, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's an astrophysicist. Uh, he loves taking space movies and pointing out the flaws in them, what they got wrong and what they got right. Uh, but he's told stories about how people will talk to him on planes not knowing who he is and try to tell him all these astrophysics things. And, and what's really funny is when someone starts talking to him about something he posted on Twitter, about a movie that he talked about. And he, you see this guy who posted this on Twitter? And he's like, no, I've never seen him before in my life. Tell me about it. And then he gets to tell him who he is and what he knows. We think about that. We think about this is God telling Job exactly who he is and what he's capable of and what he's done. And telling Job, when you answer me, answer me with this understanding. So we look at 39, and we're not going to go into a bunch of 39 here, uh, but what he does, and as we look at 39, what God talks about in there is how God created the animals and what he knows about the animals. And, and what I look at when I look through 39, it's, uh, he talks about the ostrich, 13, 39 verse 13 says this, the wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but her feathers and plumage are her feathers and plumage like the storks. She abandons her eggs on the ground and lets them be warmed in the sand. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that some wild animal may trample them. When we think about this, that God not only created all of animal kind, but he knows exactly how they work. He knows everything about every one of them. You think about if you go to the Houston Zoo, there are zookeepers for each and every animal. And they are experts in that animal. But the person who's the expert of the elephants is not the expert of the snakes. And the person who's the expert of the snakes is crazy. Not a man. But God, on the other hand, is an expert in all of them. Why? Because he created them. He put them together. He gave them those minds and knows exactly how they work. And so when you look at 39, that's what he's asking. And he starts with 38 asking Job... This is who I am. I created the heavens and the earth. I put this thing together. Then he gets to 39. He says, oh, by the way, all these animals you envy over and you look at, I built them too. It'd be like standing out with the person who owns the King Ranch here in Texas and then pointing and saying, hey, just look around. Everything that your eye can see, I own. Now, some of you think, wow, that's really cool. For me, I look at that and go, man, that's a lot to mow. So then we get to 40. And the Lord answered Job. It leads that in 40. Verses 1 through 5. Will the one who contended with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. So this is the first time. God spends two chapters sort of telling Job who he is, doing an introduction. Then he starts 40 and he says, all right, Job, time to answer. First time for you to speak. So then we see in three, the, then Job answered the Lord, I am so insignificant, how can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth, I have spoken once and will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. 
And so Job responds well. And his response, I think, would be any of us. Uh, put our hand over our mouth and say, hey, I, I tried it once. Realize that's a mistake now. I'm not going to mess up again. It is the best thing I can do at this point is what? Say nothing. Right? There's an old saying out there, right? It's better for everyone to think you're a fool and instead of what? Opening your mouth and removing all doubt. Job is having his moment right there. He's saying, I'm not going to, there's nothing I can do. It's best for me just to admit that, stay silent. I think for some of us, we would do well to heed that advice. There are moments in our life where words are necessary, but there are more moments in our life where silence is necessary. There are times in our life where we just need to simply listen to what's going on around us. We simply need to listen to what's happening. We simply need to listen to the instruction. And we look at 6 through 14. Then the Lord answered Job from the, from the whirlwind, Get ready to answer me like a man when I question you. You will inform me. So what's God saying here? Next time I ask you a question... You're going to answer. Right? You think about this like a parent. There are times in your life as a parent where you ask your kid a question and the kid clams up and you have to explain to the child, no, you're going to answer this. There's going to be a discussion here. You're going to add to it. And that's what God's saying to Job here. Nope. You wanted this discussion. You got this discussion. You're going to do it. Into eight. Would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Dagger. Because that's what Job's wanted to do, right? He's wanted to ask God about his justice, to ask God these questions. And now Job, having the moment, God says that. Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and splendor? Clothe yourself with honor and glory? Unleash your raging anger on every proud person and humiliate him, on every proud person and humble him. Trample the wicked where they stand, hide them together in the dust, imprison them in the grave. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can deliver you. So what's God saying right there? God's telling Job, if you could do all of these things like I can, then you can justify yourself. But until you can do these things like me, you have no justification. We have to think about that in our humanity. Because there's a lot of times in our lives where we think we have things figured out. Think we have a pretty good bead on things. But the truth of it is, is that our understanding of things only goes so far and it is so minuscule in comparison to the complete understanding that God has. We have to trust in his understanding. We have to trust in exactly who he is. We get into 41, and again, we're not going to cover uh, all of it here, but just what he goes into, he starts talking about Leviathan. God speaks, he says in, in 41 verse 1, Can you pull in Leviathan with a hook, or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he beg you for mercy, or speak softly to you? God goes into this idea of these large animals and how he not only knows them exactly, but he has dominion and power over them. And when we think about Leviathan, we, it's just the largest fish at the time, the largest sea animal. And for us today, that would be the blue whale. And if you think about that, it says that the blue whale's heart is the size of a Volkswagen bug or a Mini Cooper. You see those a little more often. And there's one part out here today. So if you're wondering... I think Marcy has her Mini out there. Is your Mini out there this morning? And walk outside, look at Marcy's car, and realize that's the size of a blue whale's heart. Now imagine my fishermen out there. Imagine you're out on your deep sea trip and you happen to snag one of them. You reel them in? You may try. You may think it'd be really cool, but you're cutting that line. Or you're getting drug off. You're going to lose the fight. God not only could reel that animal in, he could lift it and hold it in the palm of his hand and it would be like dust. God explaining himself to Job saying, you don't understand what you're asking for because you don't understand this. And we have to think about this. Everything God is explaining to Job about his understanding are things that are easy to God. 
The creation of the planets, the creation of these animals, that's all stuff that's simple to him, right? Humanity, he, cr he created us out of the dirt and breathed his life into us. That's easy for him. How could we ever hope to understand the depths of human suffering if we can't simply understand how God created? And so when we look at God's speaking to Job here and, and what he's trying to say, is he angry with Job? I think he's a little frustrated. But I also think if we think about God and, and his two greatest attributes, grace and mercy, I think he's also understand, trying to tell Job here, if you don't understand how I created humanity, if you don't understand how I created animal kind, if you don't understand how I created the heavens and the earth, then you're never going to understand something as complex as human emotion. Because for God, the creation of all of the things around us was easy. And if we can't understand God's easy, how would we ever understand something more difficult? It'd be like us walking into a calculus class without ever taking first grade math. You're not going to get it. You may put on a good show, you may look really good, and you might think that, but if you don't know 2 plus 2, you're never going to understand it when they start throwing letters in it, right? Some of you have gone through geometry and algebra, and you still don't get it when letters show up in math, right? The understanding here being that if we don't understand the depths of God's creation, then we should do best just to trust him. When we look at Job, the story of Job, for me, as we look here at the end, as we get into 42, the takeaway from Job is trust. It's trusting that God not only knows exactly what he's doing, but he's doing it for his own will and purposes, which we're told in Scripture are good. And so we see in 42, starting in verse 1, it says this, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I questioned you, you will inform me. I had heard rumors about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I take back my words and repent in dust and ashes. We see here, what does Job say? He goes, I spoke of what I did not know. I'm sorry. I trust in what you're doing. We think about everything that goes on around us. I think for us, those words of Job right there would speak powerfully to us. But sometimes we speak about things that we don't understand. I don't understand why everything in the world goes on. But I trust that God does. When we get into 7 and 10, 7 through 10, because... Uh, we just have to see this, what happens with the friends. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Elphaz the Tenemite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you, and I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. For you have not spoken truth about me as my servant Job has. Then Elphaz the Tenemite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namthite went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayers. And so the friends didn't get off. Some of you have probably been wondering, you know, what happens to the friends? They get their chewing, and then what is their ultimate, you know, what is the thing they have to do? They have to make this offering, and then Job prays for them. All of this time, they thought they were the righteous ones. They were the ones coming to help Job. And in the end, what got them out of trouble was Job's prayer. Never doubt the power of your prayer, even in the midst of your suffering. In the midst of being down, in the midst of the hurt, never doubt the power of the conversation you can have with God and what comes with it. So then we get into 10 through 16. It says after this, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his prosperity and doubled his previous possessions. Now, does that mean Job didn't still mourn over the loss of what he had? No, I'm sure Job mourned from then to the day he died over the loss of his children before then. But we see here where God restored. He said all of his brothers and sisters and former acquaintances came to his house, dined with him in his house. They offered him sympathy and comfort concerning all of the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a, a kesset. 
and a gold earring. Now, for those of you that wonder, we have no idea what amount of money that is. We have no, we, we can't find that use anywhere else. I can't tell you how much it is. I'd love to be able to. Someday when we go on a big trip to Jerusalem, maybe we'll find the document that tells us what it is. But to this point, we don't know. But we know that some, some amount of money was brought by his family to him and a gold earring. So then it says in 12, So the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the earlier. He owned 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 100 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named his first daughter Jemiah, which means dove. He named his second daughter Keziah, which means horn of adornment. And his third daughter, Karen Hakush, which means uh, outward and inward beauty. Or excuse me, his second daughter was named, uh, which is incense. The third one is horn of adornment, outward and inward beauty. And we've seen 15, no woman as beautiful as Job's daughters could be found in all the land. Their father granted them an inheritance with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after this and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Then Job died old and full of days. I think any of us would want our life described like that, right? How did they die? Old and Full of days. What does that mean? That he lived a full and complete life. So we look at Job and what do we, what is the end here? What do we take away from this? And I think for a lot of us, when we look at Job, we kind of think of Job as just this book of suffering. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of it is about suffering. But I think what we have to do is put this spin, and this is what I loved about my Old Testament professor, because this is the spin he put on it for me. The idea of Job is about trust. And where's your trust going to be? And when we look at Job, what do we see? Job never stopped trusting in God. Even though he questioned, even though he wondered, he still trusted. He never once turned his back. He never once said he was walking away. He never once said, well, because this happened to me, I'm out. I'm done. Right? God was mean to me, so I'm not his friend anymore. That never happened. In the midst of it, Job still trusted. Job still understood who God was. And I think for us, we have to put that same understanding in our lives. In the midst of the things that we don't think are fair, right? Especially as 2020 Americans. Well, that's like, it's like our favorite, one of our favorite phrases now, right? It's not fair. I wasn't given a fair shake. Everybody, everybody's out to get me. Nobody owes you anything. God doesn't owe us anything. I've heard people say this. I've had conversations with people that think, well, if God would just give me. No, 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 no. God doesn't owe us a thing. Job got to that understanding that God didn't owe Job anything. Yet God blessed him anyway. The same for our lives today. God doesn't owe us a thing, yet all of us could look to the blessings God's given us on a daily basis. And so my challenge to his church is that if you've never accepted Christ, if you've never accepted God, realize he doesn't owe you anything. But he still sent his son to die for you. He still sent his son to be an offering for you. And if you would simply call on his name, confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, so that you'll be saved. Second, for those of us that have accepted Christ, those of us that are Christians, it's not our job to question what God is doing. It's our job to seek out after him and do the best we can to be like Jesus and understand that God knows exactly what he's doing. So you've got to figure out where you're at now. If you haven't accepted Jesus, that is absolutely step one. If we have, then it's on us to trust what God is doing and try to see other people come to know him. What's the best thing we can do for God in 2020? Lead people to Jesus. Jesus is coming back. That we know for sure. Do we know exactly when? Nope, we don't. So witness like somebody's life depended on it. Share Christ like their life depends on it, because it does. Because we don't know the day or the hour. The church, we're told, it's coming soon. Be the hands and feet to the community around you. Be the best example of Jesus you can be and lead others to Christ. Trust in what God is doing. With that, let us pray. God, we just thank you for your example. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your holiness. We 
thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. God, for those that don't know you yet, I pray that they would make that choice, that they would choose to accept you as Lord and Savior, admit their sin, admit that the only way is through you. God, for those of us that do know you and have been struggling with trust or just fighting with you, God, I pray that we would give up that fight and trust in exactly what you're doing. We would give you the glory and honor you deserve. God, we thank you for the blessings you give us, even though we are undeserving of any of them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us, church. We want to thank you for joining us today on YouTube as we finished out our Job study. Uh, if you're in the Lytle San Antonio area, we would love to have you come join us in person Sundays at 11 a.m. Uh, until then, remember, we love you. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that. Until then, stay safe. We'll see you soon.